The last time we spoke about efforts and commitment, we were talking about chapter one in the Yoga Sutras, verses 19 to 22. This is a very important section. It is a very practical section here. We had stopped the last time at verse 20, so we will continue from there. In verse 21, we see that the Yoga Sutras is talking about the intensity, the desire of wanting to attain a higher state of consciousness. Those with a high degree of intensity attain higher levels of consciousness quickly. Verse 22 says, depending on the system of techniques and philosophy practiced, there are differences even among the most enthusiastic of students. So here we have the idea of intensity of practice. We are so used to the idea of studying or acquiring knowledge for profession. The idea that we can spend even 10 years or over 10 years doing that is not unusual. We go to schools, colleges, or we have specialized education, and that can be up to 15 years as well. Yet, when it comes to meditation, or attaining higher levels of consciousness, we are not comfortable with the idea of a long-term practice. You may remember that in verse 14, we talked about having a practice sustained over a long period of time without interruption, without a break. Yet, we do not have that same intensity when it comes to meditation. Some research in the recent years has shown that to become an expert in anything, in any field, such as music or sport, you need to have at least 10,000 hours of meditation. Uh, sorry, 10,000 hours of practice. If even an, a thing like music, to learn the piano, or to become really good in any one sport, you need 10,000 hours. We could use that same concept here and say we need something like 10,000 hours of meditation before we can say that we have really attained something. If you do the math, it may seem a little bit of a shock, it may come as a shock to you. It's considering a person who is taking up to six hours a day of meditation. That's a full time meditation because if you go to a college or university or a job, if you have a job from nine to five and you have an hour for lunch and maybe half an hour for tea and some breaks in between, you're talking about working for six hours. That's a full day. The same goes for school or college. So if you're talking about meditating, practicing for six hours a day, to get 10,000 hours, 
takes 8.3 years. That's full-time practice to become an expert, an edit. We are well aware of the fact that very few people want to do this full-time. So if we take half the time, that is three hours a day, which is doable, which is, which is not totally unrealistic, if you take an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening, it's one and a half hours, and maybe through the day, another half an hour or an hour here and there, you have three hours a day. Still, we're talking about 16 years. That's quite a long time for most people. But it is not unrealistic if you consider that we spend around the same amount of time to prepare ourselves for a profession. If you take 10, 12 years of schooling, plus another three or four years, you have something like 15, 16 years of education to prepare yourself for a job. So I don't find 16 years of practice with approximately three hours a day to be unrealistic or asking for too much. I think that's something everybody should do for themselves. If we reduce the amount of time per day to one hour a day, you will only have You will, have, you will need 50 years. You need 50 years. That's the math. You need 50 years to get 10,000 hours. That's a long time. Well, that's a really long time. The reason we are going through this calculation is very simple. It's to help you understand the importance of... Practice, to do it daily, it's really something valuable that you need to do for yourself. There is a certain idea, especially in India, that meditation and yoga, all these things, spirituality itself, is something for older people. You do it when you are done with the kids, you know, the kids are out of the house, you're, you're, you're done with your job, you're retired, now you have lots of time. But what happens then? You're 60 or 65 years old, you don't have that enthusiasm, you don't have that concentration, you don't have the energy. And to start at the age of 60 or 65 with something totally new without having a foundation is very difficult, if not impossible. That is why even if you cannot do three hours a day, at least start with one hour a day so that eventually one can build it up further when you have maybe more time. The reason we are doing this calculation is really to emphasize the importance of practice, daily practice over a long period of time, unbroken, uninterrupted. It's important not to postpone this. That's what most people do, especially in India. People say, yes, I'm a householder now, or I'm a student, or I'm a householder, and so I'm going to do this after I've done with my duties, and that's going to be after the age of 50 or 55. If you postpone enlightenment, if you postpone meditation, you will find at the age of 55 or 60 that it's very hard to begin from scratch. Any questions about this? Anything anybody would like to share?
If I may ask. Yes. This is Bina. Um, considering um, intensity, you're expressing it in regard to the continuous practice and you know daily practice as far as hours. What do you have to say with the interpretation of intensity being one where it's not just the practice itself, but how the practice is approached um, in, in the way that intensity could also be interpreted um, as fervor, intent. Um, I don't have wor other words around it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, that comes in the next verse. <laughs> that's verse 22. Okay. <laughs> so that's a nice transition. So verse 22 talks about this, uh, in fact, that there are different types of techniques and the teachings or the philosophy that is, goes with it. And so you have three kinds of methods. The methods have been categorized as slow, medium, and fast. Slow methods are methods that are very external, like rituals, for example. The fast ones, the speedy methods, are those that are internal. And medium is something in between. It's a mix, perhaps, of both. Now, these combined with the three kinds of students. Now, the three kinds of students is something you see that it's in brackets. The reason is that it doesn't come from the Yoga Sutras. It comes from the very first commentary on the Yoga Sutras by Vyas. That's the Vyas Bhasyam. So <laughs> it's very uh, authentic and it's uh, very useful because it divides students as well into three categories of intensity or to use the word Veena said that was fervor. You could have mild intensity or ardor as sometimes it is translated, medium or high. Now, if you think about this carefully, if you have a very mild intensity, person of mild intensity, using a slow method, that would be naturally the slowest of them all. But if you have somebody with a very high intensity using a speedy method, a fast method, the highway, so to say, that person would be really very fast, would attain high levels of consciousness quickly, as it says in verse 21. So we have used the idea of hours to help us with, help the mind actually, mind likes to have a little bit you know, likes to do math and likes a little bit of calculation, it can grasp the concept better. But if you see it in this term of slow, medium, and fast, that's also quite useful. The methods really are not just slow, it's not just rituals, but also methods that may be not consistent. If, for example, you keep jumping from one system to another. You go to one teacher, you go to another tradition, you go to the, to the second teacher, or you don't go to any teachers, and you just look in the internet, you read books, you look at websites and, and YouTube, and you create your own mishmash of stuff, which you do. That would also come in that category. Fast is generally an internal tradition, a, a teacher that guides you systematically, and that's why it's called the highway. We say, there's a nice adage which says, follow the path of sages. The sages have already crossed these various domains of the mind, of the unconscious mind. They have gone through this. They have left behind the maps. 
They have left behind living traditions, and this has been handed down from teacher to student. So there are lineages which have these practices accompanied with the correct interpretation of scriptures. And that's the highway. That's the fastest way. In between, there's something between the two, and that's medium. So depending on the kind of intensity you already have, matching up with the kind of method you use, you see there are different possibilities for progress. I have often said this um, to, to people in uh, the meetings as well as those who come around here. Those of you who would like to have systematic practice, would like to have some guidance, you're most welcome to write to me and we will see how we can work that out. It's important that one makes a commitment to practice and is willing to integrate this into one's life. So, any questions so far? Or any comments? Okay, we come to the next group of verses and it's called Contemplation of Om. All that you see uh, marked in brackets generally comes from the Vyas Bhasya or is a clarification that I have added to make things a little bit more readable. The sutras, as you know, are just aphorisms. They don't necessarily connect to each other, which makes it very difficult to read or to make the connection from one to the other. So verse 23 says, surrender to Ishwar. Obviously, that makes no sense. So we read it. Is it possible to attain the highest through intensity of practice or meditation? Or are there other means? So there are other means, and that is surrender to Ishwar. Ishwar is pure consciousness. There are many words which have basically the same meaning. Sanskrit is an interesting language because you will find one Sanskrit word has up to 40 meanings and it makes the language much more interesting, colorful, wonderful for poetry and literature, but in a more technical scripture such as the Yoga Sutra, it's important to understand which meaning is meant. Similarly, one concept or idea can also have many different words depending on which perspective you're looking at it from. If you're looking at it from Sankhya perspective, it's got a different name. If you're looking at it from a Vedanta perspective, it's a different name. If you're looking at it from a Tantric angle, it's got a different name. In layman's language, we call it differently. So sometimes these terms can be very confusing. So Ishwar has got many other names. It is, in English, we can also call it pure consciousness. It's also called Shakti. It's called Paramatman in the Vedas or Brahman. It's also called universal consciousness, the universal self, 
the witness, sometimes we simply say that or tat, that, simply that. That's where we get our name from, that first. Or it is simply God. Very controversial word, but that's what it is, God. What is Ishwar? According to Yoga Sutras, Ishwa is Purusha of your consciousness that has never been affected by coloring, that is glaciers, by karma, the result of actions or samskaras. So Ishwar is a very special form of Purusha of your consciousness. For this I'd like you to see our favorite diagram. And we see here, this is the yogic anatomy. This is what you look like. So there is a center of consciousness here. There's the unconscious mind, active as well as latent. There's the conscious mind. This breath, this body, and the senses. So we're moving outwards. Center of consciousness or pure consciousness has incarnated, has acquired a body. Now, this center of consciousness, when it wouldn't have a body, that means none of all this is there. There's only center of consciousness. Now imagine that this center of consciousness never had ever anybody. It never had a mind. It was never attached to any mind or body. It never incarnated. Such a purusha or center of consciousness, such a being is Ishwar. And you can imagine that if never had incarnated, then it is universal consciousness. It's everything. So Purusha is just this part. It's just consciousness. Consciousness that has never incarnated. The consciousness that's within you and me and everybody else has incarnated. It has come in touch with some coloring here in the active and latent unconscious mind, in the conscious mind. These are glaciers. It has been involved with karma here at the level of the world, at the phenomenal world level. And so the pure consciousness that is in us is incarnated, and that's not the Ishvara we are talking about. We're talking about that center of consciousness or pure consciousness that has never incarnated. I hope that makes some sense to you. Any questions about this? Okay. Adhika ji? Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering what you meant by incarnate. Does it mean that, that it has never taken a, a form? Yes, uh, you have taken a form. The pure consciousness that resides within you has taken a form. Yeah. The pure consciousness okay. that resides in me has also taken a form. Or, oh, for example, yeah. it has taken forms in terms of animals, birds, trees. All these are forms, living beings. And pure consciousness resides in all of these. 
But that which is formless, that has never taken a form, that is Ishwar. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we go back to our text. Now that perhaps the idea of Ishwar is a little bit clearer, you might understand that in Ishwar, the seed of omniscience has reached the highest state of development. We saw the center of consciousness that was like a seed. You saw there was a seed and out of that seed came out, emerged a being. Whether it was a human being or an animal or a plant, that does not matter. But there was a being that incarnated out of it. So out of that seed. So this seed, now when it's on its own and it doesn't have any form, imagine that it expands. and comes universal consciousness. It's expanded totally because it has no limits. It's not been limited. Your consciousness is limited in the body. Think of the body to be a pot. And in this pot, you put a little candle. That light, the light of consciousness, is now restricted by this pot. But if you break the pot, the light spreads out and fills the room. So also, if there is no limitation of the body, then that consciousness is always expanded. That's universal consciousness. And such an expanded consciousness or universal consciousness has reached the highest state of development. And that is omniscience. That is, all of knowledge is within universal consciousness. Since this consciousness has expanded totally, it's universal consciousness, it is also unconditioned by time. Universal consciousness knows no time. And universal consciousness has been and will be, is and will be. It always was, it is and always will be. It's not conditioned. So universal consciousness is a teacher even of the ancients. So the same universal consciousness that can be your guide within is also the teacher of people before us, all those who came before us. So if you think about this a little bit, and contemplate on this, you will see that what the first verse said was, surrender to Ishwar. This is nothing other than Ishwar Pranidhan. For those of you who know a little bit about this Yamas and Niyamas, it's the last of the Niyamas, Ishwar Pranidhan, surrender to Ishwar. A lot of people say, almost mechanically, when they are in trouble, oh, I surrender to God and I surrender to Ishwar. But we are not talking about just some mechanical idea or parroting words. We are talking about a very deep, intense experience, a direct experience as a result of meditation. It's a form of samadhi. We talked about this objectless meditation in our earlier session when we talked about the levels of samadhi. And so that's basically what it is. When you know that the world, the thoughts, the mental images, emotions, desires, everything is transient and changing. 
you know through direct experience that the only constant and eternal is pure consciousness. This automatically, naturally, will lead us to surrender. It is not surrender to a being or to a person or to a thing. It is simply surrender. You cannot help but surrender before such glory, such beauty, such, such wonder. And that is Ishwar Pranidhan. It's a natural state that occurs the highest levels of consciousness. A state of pure trust. It's like walking in the dark and still knowing that nothing is going to happen to you that you are taken care of. That kind of trust is very rare. Any questions so far about this, Ishwar Pranidhan? Yes, um, to Stuart, is this uh, Bhakti Yoga? Yes, exactly. This is leading to Bhakti. Now, very often, people think that bhakti yoga is about singing, dancing, chanting, uh, you know, some sort of gatherings where there's, um, you know, rituals. But it may be ritual, ritualistic, uh, but it's, that is, that's not what is meant by bhakti yoga. Those may be external and may be useful, may be comforting, but here we are talking about the bhava that emerges. It is a bhava, and the word bhava has, again, many meanings. It's that direct experience itself. And so it is not something you feel when you listen to devotional music. It's something that springs from within you. So that bhava is also called yoga mahabhava. That's that experience, that longing to have that kind of trust. That's the divinity, that's divine. So here we can begin to understand the difference between bhakti or devotion, which springs from within, and doing ritualistic practices. That's a completely different thing. That's not necessarily bhakti. Shibu Surrender is after we've did our part, whatever result comes, we have to accept it. That is what <laughs> people say. The way you have written it says, we have to accept it with full heart. Yeah, but the words, we have to accept, doesn't sound like you have accepted it. It sounds like it has been forced. You have no other alternative, so you have to accept it. What surrender is, is not necessarily to do with your actions or your result, but here we're talking about surrender to pure consciousness is, is simply surrender. There is just trust that everything is going to work out. It's not I surrender my actions or I surrender to somebody. It is simply surrender. And I know that that may be difficult to understand. 
So we just let that sit here the way it is. Beth, um, you asked about surrender only in context of non-bodied. I'm not sure uh, what you mean by that. I, I don't know that I have uh, the words to express it yet, and it also might not be appropriate for a public forum. Okay. All right. In that case, I would leave that for the time being and uh, continue with that. Surrender is also uh, a topic that everybody has their own approach to. And so here, the Yoga Sutras is referring to surrender to Ishvara, which is pure consciousness. It's not referring to surrender to your teacher, surrender to a deity, surrender the fruits of your action. It is specifically regarding this concept, which is the highest state. That's why Ishwar Pranidhan is the last of the niyamas. Okay? And I have made a note here in brackets. We're talking about objectless meditation. And I have mentioned also it's the way suited to advanced students or to adepts. What happens next? Surrender to Ishvara. Verse 27 says, The mystic sound designating Ishvara is Pranav or Om. And yogis, verse 28 says, Yogis will remember Om and contemplate on its meaning. So first, Om and Ishwar are one and the same. Om is the direct experience of the three states of consciousness. And the yogi who contemplates on his meaning has basically the direct experience of the three states of consciousness and the fourth, that is our true nature. For this, I go back to my favorite diagram. And here we are. Om is got three letters when we see it in English. And in Sanskrit, it's got three sounds, a, u, and ma. A, or a, the alphabet a, is designated to this part here, the mortal self, the body, the senses, the breath, the conscious mind, and the entire world, the entire phenomenal world. That's all waking consciousness. And that has been given a, a syllable or a, a sound. And that sound is called a. Uh, that's been designated. It's just been given this. It's a sort of almost arbitrary, you can say. The next sound is U, or the English letter U. And that is this part here inside, active unconscious mind. That's the dreaming state. When you go to bed at night, you have dreams. Not all the time, but there's a cycle of dreams and you have dreams. And that's the dream state. Ooh. The next letter, M, or the Sanskrit sound, Ma, is this one here. Latent, the latent state. This is the latent unconscious mind or deep sleep. So you have alternate cycles at night between dreaming and deep sleep. In deep sleep, there's apparently no content. 
you don't dream. If you were aware, then you would experience the center of consciousness there shining through. But you're not aware. You're in deep sleep and you're unaware. You're in a tamasic state. So you don't see it. And that is Ma. So what is Om? All this is Om. And mm, it goes to the silence. So Om. And you hum it. Mm, it goes to the silence. And there's the silence here. This is the silence. This is the fourth. And that is pure consciousness. So if a yogi contemplates on this, doesn't mean that he is mindlessly repeating Om, 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 Om. He's not parroting it. Contemplating on Om means having the direct experience of the waking consciousness, dreaming consciousness and latent unconscious mind. That means you are aware of the transition between waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. And in deep sleep, you are aware of deep sleep. And you are aware that you are pure consciousness. And when that happens, you have a, a real understanding of what OM means. So when you talk about meaning, we're not talking about a translation. It's a question that I ask very often is, what is the meaning of Jal? Jal is a Sanskrit word. What is the meaning of Jal? And some people say Jal means water, water in English. Or they would say in Hindi, it means Pani. Or they would say in German, it's Vasa. And I ask, is that the meaning of water? Jal? No, that's a translation. What is the meaning of water? When you take a shower in the morning and you experience this refreshing thing all over yourself, you're beginning to get at the meaning of water. When somebody pushes you into the deep end of a, a swimming pool or a lake and you can't swim and you're drowning, you know, you begin to understand this, this fluid thing, this transparent, tasteless thing which has no smell either is water. And then when you are trudging through the desert in the heat and you're dying because your mouth is dry, and you don't have any water, and then this one drop of water which falls into your mouth, the last drop from your bottle perhaps, and suddenly you know what the meaning of water is. It flashes to you. Water means life. So what is Jal? Jal is not just water. It's life. So you must understand that the word Om, you can translate it however you want. You can say it's a mystic sound. Or you can say whatever you want. But the meaning lies in the experience of it. And only then do you understand what it means. I will continue to the other couple of verses on Om, or the other one verse on Om, before I ask more questions. When you really begin to understand the meaning of Om, from then onwards, consciousness turns inward. 
and obstacles are removed. Most of the time, our consciousness is turned outward. We have incarnated. So we have emerged from the center of consciousness, moved outward, and are residing in this external world. So consciousness is always moving outwards. At night, when we go to bed, it moves inward, but not completely. And so, when we begin to understand OM, that OM is in fact everything, it's universal self, it's this entire picture here, the whole thing is OM. When we begin to understand that, Consciousness starts turning inwards, right up here, and all obstacles seem to disappear. They do disappear. They become irrelevant, these obstacles. <clears throat> so, I can take questions toward us. So to contemplate is not just thinking, it's an advanced practice. Yes, contemplation is not sitting here and saying, hmm, om, I wonder what it means, and let me say om, om, om. It's not this kind of a monologue, or it's not thinking about this, the things you read, or thinking about your new knowledge about om, now that you know it's three syllables and the three sounds have been designated to something so it's not an intellectual kind of exercise that you do do just with yourself alone you know it's not it's not thinking it's not contemplating in the sense of just thinking about what you have learned it is in fact unlearning when you have the direct experience of these things, you start unlearning. You will start forgetting everything that you have read or seen. Uh, and and you, you start acquiring a new kind of knowledge. For lack of a better word, I say a new kind of knowledge. Because this knowledge which comes from within is not comparable with the knowledge from books with the knowledge from uh, the, the knowledge about the world. So the things we learned in school are of little use here. The things we learned in order to make us good at our professions is of little use here. In fact, it might even be an obstacle because it's so limiting. Right. So, yes, indeed, it is advanced in the sense that um, it's about direct experience. I do not want to say advanced in the sense that you will never attain that. It's something for very special people. Actually, all of us can attain this. We just need to have systematic practice. And we need to strengthen our intensity. Those were the two things we we did that um, just today. We talked about that here, and we said that basically it depends the, on the intensity of desire here, and it depends upon your method. So when you have high intensity of desire and you have a fast method, a systematic method, then it's not really all that advanced. It seems advanced when you do not have a high intensity of desire or you simply have a slow method or both. So what we can do is we can cultivate this intensity, strengthen it, or we try to acquire a fast method, systematic method. Uh, 
Okay, Beth. <clears throat> Direct experience of this as based on the text can occur but may not be held and the journey continues to return to that state of being. I'm sorry, Beth, but I do not understand whether that's a question or just a comment. So we will continue to the obstacles in practice. So that would answer your uh, question, Beth, the earlier one on obstacles. That in practice, there will be obstacles. And as one proceeds, continues, the solution was always continue your practice and the and the obstacles will disappear, basically. That's what the, the text says, to put it in very simple language. What are these obstacles? That's one thing we really need to understand, because we all have obstacles. If it weren't for these obstacles, we would return to the natural state very easily. So there are nine obstacles. We may not be able to cover all nine today. Perhaps we do, but if not, we continue next time. The first one is disease. The very word disease tells us something. Dis-ease is a lack of ease. When the body is not in its natural state. There is an imbalance. In modern terms, we might talk about stress. In pranic terms, we say the pranic vehicles are disturbed. We talk about imbalance when we say there's the Ida and Pingala, the dualities are not in balance. The ancient Greeks called a state of balance homeostasis. It's a state of balance. When you're in a state of balance, the body mind is healthy. Most disease come from the mind. And so when the mind is not balanced, pranic vehicles are not balanced, there are obstacles, obstructions in the pranic vehicles, this causes disease. In our modern life, we have a lot of disease that I think are a result of, purely a result of poor lifestyle, wrong food habits, really is one of the major issues. Too much sugar, very often too much food, wrong kind of food, very heavy, All these things related to food also cause a lot of disease. So all these factors, mental, physical and lifestyle put together, create a state of imbalance in the body, which is called disease. It's the first obstacle because it's also probably one of the most common ones. A lot of people are suffering from disease which prevents them really from doing really any kind of practice. When I speak of abhyasa or practice at any point of time, I'm not referring only to asanas, but also to meditation practices. A systematic practice includes asanas, or something at a physical level, pranic level, and at the mental level. And it has a structure. It goes from gross to subtle. So when I talk about practice, I'm referring to this systematic approach. So when the body and mind is diseased, it is 
not really possible to do deeper meditation because the body will always pull you out, the body will always pull you back. And so we need to deal with that. If the reasons are food habits, we need to work with that. If the reasons are mental, discomfort, stress, whatever lifestyle, surroundings, we need to remove those obstacles. So working with disease is a very important aspect. In the early days, this was a part which was dealt by Ayurveda. Ayurveda and yoga are sister sciences. They still are, only unfortunately, um, this is not really understood clearly. So it, it's not practiced in the right way. Any questions about the first obstacle? Any comments regarding this very first obstacle? Most of us have some kind of disease, whether it's may not be chronic, but Perhaps the body is a bit weak and susceptible. So when you do have some issues with disease, then you need to check, are my food habits good? Am I eating correctly? Is my lifestyle good? Am I being forced into some stressful situations because of my surroundings? Then look for a solution. How can you get out of that? If the reasons are mental, then you need to understand what is the cause of that, those mental issues, behavioral issues, and work with that. So disease is something that most of us have in some form of the other. <clears throat> There are a lot of food intolerances, for example, these days. It's become very common, allergies and food intolerances. This is also partly because of uh, environment and partly it's because of uh, our attitudes. But when you don't have a solution, one needs to then take care about the food you eat. Dullness of the mind, that's the second one. And this was actually discussed in one of the first sessions we had. I think it was in fact the second one in the lecture two, where we talked about the different kinds of minds. And we mentioned that there are, most minds are distracted. The kshipta minds they were called, distracted. But there were two other minds which are not suitable for meditation. And that is shipta and muda. Shipta being a mind which is very restless. And muda is a mind which is very, very dull. And so when you have a mind which is dull and... Uh, has difficulties in concentration, keeps falling asleep, for instance, during practices, then that is an obstacle. Here also, the reasons can sometimes be easily removed. Food, for example, if you eat tamasic foods, foods that are very heavy, the wrong foods can also cause dullness of the mind, heaviness of the body, and this is something that can be solved relatively easily 
by change of diet. But if the causes are different, that is far deeper causes, naturally it is more difficult to solve this problem. Okay. Any questions about these two obstacles? If not, then we will end this session here. Continue next time. The subject of obstacles is very interesting. It's also very useful for all of us. Because removal of obstacles is actually one of the most important parts of practice. Once the obstacles are removed, it's like a water you know, a river which has been dammed. If the dam is broken down, suddenly the water flows. So if you remove obstacles, the energy starts flowing naturally to higher levels of consciousness. So this is a very important topic. I hope to see you all next time. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Nita. Bye, Bina. Bye, Shibu. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Radhika. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.